Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Everybody thank Jenny a lot. She does a lot of work and, you know, puts a lot behind this. And uh, <clears throat> she's the gear behind the axle that makes this thing turn. So thanks, Jenny. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is, I should say, good lunchtime, afternoon now. My name is David Parks. I'm with the Maryland Pesticide Regulatory Section of the Department of Agriculture. I'm here today to give you an update. Um, <clears throat> I was kind of glad you did the survey and say it at the same time. That gave me a little buffer to keep you between lunchtime and Mr. Paul Gunther's meat, but now, I, now I'm holding you up from lunch, so I'm not real happy. But it did show me the survey, the fact that you're happy to be here. Glad to know that. Um, with us today as well, we have Russ Nortel. Russ, can you raise your hand? Russ is our License and Certification Coordinator for the Maryland Department of Agriculture now. Um, Russ just took that position. So if you guys need updating or if he approves the recertification classes like today and <clears throat> has a lot to do with the licensing as well. So um, just want to introduce Russ as well. He's here from the Western Shore. We braved the weather to come over and see us. <clears throat> Again, my name is David Park, so you have to bear with me a little bit. I've had a couple of colds over the winter time and uh, getting a little scratchy, but we'll work through it and uh, try to get you through the lunch as quick as we can. I'm good. Thank you, Jenny. <clears throat> So um, with the Maryland Department of Agriculture, we're also, we're under the Environmental Protection Agency of Federals as well. We have to adhere to at least their standards or above. Um, we can't have anything under them. And some of their new rules for this year, as you can see, um, the recertification um, rules went into effect in 2018. Um, private applicators, registered applicators, be at least 18 years old. Um, barring some family situations, we'll go through that in a little bit. Change in requirements, annual training, um, and new soil fumigation category in regards to private applicators. I doubt any of you guys are dealing with that here, so we'll move on pretty good, quick. Um, Maryland is looking into updating a few licenses again to keep up with the federal standards um, in regards to age. Um, the restricted use pesticides, RUPs, restricted use pesticides. We're going to go into that a couple, couple things here, one of which I think you're all going to be a little bit surprised to learn <clears throat> here in a few minutes, but um, have to uh, adhere to the federal standards as well. And Maryland is looking into defining, defining drift. Um, as you know, our, um, some of you may know or may not know, our state chemist just got a new um, um, analyzation machine and they can pick up down to the parts per billion. Um, you know, and it's such a minute um, trace that we can pick up now we're trying to define drift. It's in other states, um, so we're coming to that determination slowly but surely, but we want to get a baseline where we say, okay, this is drift or this isn't drift. <clears throat> dicamba, you guys are, a lot of you here today to get your dicamba training. Um, some of the, um, the labels changed a little bit over this past year. Always encourage everybody to read up on your labels. Um, in regards to some of the changes were the time of application, the wind, um, the records, of course it's restricted use, and um, the clean out procedures are now on the label as well. How many of you guys have seen this label or one similar to it? <coughs> Excuse me. Paraquat dichloride. Paraquat. Used it for years and years and years. Much like dicamba now, it's been, gonna become even more restricted as a restricted use pesticide. Um, here are some of the uh, new label changes that are on the way and to be in effect by September 30th. Um, to apply Grimoxone in the future, you're going to need to be a certified applicator or have your restricted use private applicator's license. Um, no longer will they let registered employees in the future apply Paraquat. Some people are umbrellaed, especially with the companies, um, they're umbrellaed under the company certified applicator as a registered employee. That cannot happen anymore with the new regulations. So those, those have changed. There's also gonna be special um, paraquat dichloride training as well that's, that's gonna be required, much like the dicamba certification that you're gonna get. <clears throat> um, this is supposed to be online. It's all in the works right now with EPA. I just wanted to kind of bring it to your attention, especially as private applicators and farmers. A lot of the certified guys know about it through their companies, but um, farmers may not as well. So just keep an eye out for the new labels. Um, again, they'll be out as of September 30th. And um, you know, once that new label takes over the product that you have now, the label's the law. 
Okay, so it's the same old regulations as far as para, the paraquat dichloride goes. But at the end of September, the new labels have to be out. <clears throat> These are some of the time frames. <clears throat> By October 1st, they will have the new label. Um, training material is to be in a place. Um, they say 3-30-2018, it's still in the works. Um, and implemented by 3-30-2018, but, and then it also, bless you, it also pertained to the, um, the um, stewards of pesticides, of dicamba, or excuse me, paraquat dichloride, so keep an eye out for that. Again, it's all on the label. Do a little bit of research. If you have any questions, I can talk to you in particular after the after presentation as well. Worker protection standards apply a lot to, you know, vegetable farmers or, um, or uh, nurseries, you know, you guys can, uh, some of that um, training has changed as um, far as the workers and handlers. Um, there's no longer a grace period. You used to have that time. You have to be um, trained immediately upon, um, upon uh, hiring before they can do any work. And also, um, no longer can handlers do, present the training. You have to be certified applicators, state or federal approved trainers, and, um, or those who have completed their EPA approved course um, <coughs> And this, this was effective last year. And there's a, um, coming up, there's a website. So if you guys need that, just take a picture of that slide and you can get on there and it'll go through what you need to do to get your, your guys trained and certified. <clears throat> Early entry, just some more things that are um, taking place that have to be at least 18 years old. Again, with immediate family members, always look into those stipulations as far as family farm operations. Um, you know, there are different stipulations for those. And that website, <clears throat> goes into that particular as well and um, the um, respirator training as well so all those are just changes that you can definitely look into and go into detail on the website <clears throat> um, specific water amounts for each worker one gallon for each worker three gallons for each handler always follow the labels and there's that website so you can go through any of those regulations on that website look at them see what you need to do to adhere to the new WPS Worker protection standards. Field watch. How many of you guys heard of this? Jim had it over to his prices over in Carolina County. Pretty neat thing. Um, <clears throat> basically, it's a good thing is to uh, it lets people know where um, pollinators may be, beekeepers, um, sensitive crops, things of that nature. Um, I had a lady <laughs> just right before Jim's presentation. I had a lady call me, and she said that um, she was going to put in beehives. And she wanted to make sure that the farmer next door didn't spray any pesticides. Did you get that? <laughs> so I told her, well, as a right to farm act, you cannot do that. But I said, you can also look into this, you know, register your hives, let them know that you're going to, you know, um, have hives there. I said, most guys are willing to work with you. I said, communication, communication, communication prevents confrontation. Um, so this is a good communicative tool. Um, we're not on there, we are registered now. But um, I looked on it and of course, you know, hives, um, um, sensitive crops, grapes, things of that nature. Um, Mr. Bill Mason's here, organic. You can register organic crops. Um, just to let people wear, you know, it's a good thing to look around, take a look at your area, get on here and play around a little bit and see what might be around, because you never know, you know. And um, we'll go into it a little later with the bees. You know, Maryland's got a we're the highest restricted, in far in my opinion, one of the highest restricted states as far as um, the pollinators. The Pollinator Protection Act is in, in effect in Maryland now. And um, it, uh, it's really about the beekeepers and protecting the bees. So it just goes through, it, it lets you know um, the different ways to access the website and what you know, is entailed in each spot. So Pollinator Protection Act. Neonicotinoid pesticides can no longer be sold by someone who isn't licensed. They have to be a licensed dealer in the state of Maryland. So like your little marketplaces, things of that nature, <clears throat> we go in there and as um, inspectors with the state of Maryland, we check and make sure they're, they either don't have the product on their shelf because it now is a restricted use pesticide with the state of Maryland, or they have a dealer's license to be able to sell that much like your Talbot Ags or whoever company you know you buy, buy your uh, chemicals from your restricted use pesticides so they have to go about that process or take it off their take it off their shelves <clears throat> this applies a lot to homeowners um, but basically what it is the gist of it is 
um, homeowners not supposed to buy, not supposed to purchase systemic um, neonicotinoid pesticides and apply them unless they're a registered applicator or they have a registered applicator do the application. Um, it keeps them from putting those on the roses and things of that nature. So this is our breakdown as far as our personnel, um, subject to change a lot in the coming year. Um, <laughs> Mr. Dennis Howard um, took Mary Ellen Settings place um, years ago. I know a lot of you knew Miss Mary Ellen, but um, he's been with the department 45 years, Russ. 45 years, Mr. Dennis has been there. Really nice man, um, very even keel guy. But he's he's sailing off into the sunset and going to have a good retirement this year. Rob Hofstetter is now our enforcement coordinator. <clears throat> um, as I go through, Jenny asked me today to do a little presentation from complaint call in to investigation, the result thereof. I'll, you know, I'll go through it in detail in a little bit, but um, Rob's ultimately the guy that I report everything to and lay it on his desk and say, here you go, here's the facts. So um, Russ Nortel again, he's our acting and current certification and training coordinator, doing a great job. He's loving life in the office there. Mr. Ellis Tinsley has been around for 32 years, I believe, and uh, Mr. Ellis is my direct supervisor. Um, nice man, and uh, he's, he's retiring this year, too, so he'll be leaving us as well. Excuse me. If you call into the office, um, you'll talk to one of these ladies, um, or Rob. <laughs> um, Jessica Kuntz is our office administrator. She's the head honcho around there. Miss Carolyn is next. And then Hannah, Rob, and Gina. <clears throat> excuse me, are in the office. And these are one, one to talk to. Very helpful. They're always willing to help you. Um, Hannah's a great lady. She has a strong accent, so bear with her. Um, I cannot understand her sometimes. I'll be honest with you. So I'll ask for Carolyn. You know, it's just mine because I'm like impaired by my Eastern Shore heritage, I guess. I just cannot understand her accent at times. So I just ask to speak to Hannah. And she's very, or Carolyn and, or Rob, and they're very nice. And they'll help you out any way they can. You can also call me. I've got cards here. You can call the department and ask for my number. They can transfer you. I'll be glad to help anybody any way I can. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a breakdown of our territories. Um, up top, as you can see, ladies first, we got Miss Kelly Love. May have, some of you may have known her. She was in turf um, management for years and now has come on board as an inspector with the pesticide regulation section. Um, we have Yop out here in Western Maryland. He's always happy and smiling. Bray is down here in the Southern Maryland, around Montgomery County. And then right now I have the entire Eastern Shore of Maryland. So as you can see, I'm spread thinner than poor man's butter. Um, but uh, there, eventually we will split the shore. And um, from Carolina Talbot South, actually from um, Talbot, Dorchester South, and then North will be someone else's territory or vice versa. Um, so eventually the shore will be split. We'll have another inspector here on the shore. Pesticide regulation overview. This just basically gives you an idea of who's licensed in the state of Maryland. Um, we have 1,113 pest control businesses. A lot of people don't realize we regulate home pests as well. Your, your organs, home paramount, things of that nature. Um, bug be gone or whatever they may be called this day. Um, 240 licensed public agencies. That includes your municipalities, your state, local governments. 3,202 certified applicators. As you can see, Agriculture is 276 of those 3,200. We just had an exam um, last week, and there was 175 examinees in the um, exam to get their license. And I would say, we think maybe 20, Russ, maybe 15, or in regards to ag, something like that. Very small percentage. So, as you can see, you know, I know you guys think I'm out here just pestering you all, but it's actually mainly home pests that I deal with a lot of times. Um, 13 certified in category 1B, those are all grain treatment. Um, 2,973 private applicators. A lot of you guys in here are private guys. Um, so it is a vast portion of what, what I deal with as well here on the shore. <clears throat> and then this one's a big one. Remember dicamba and uh, paraquat dichloride? These guys pretty soon, you know, will not be able to spray them as registered employees. You have to be certified or take special training in regards to the dicamba, which we'll get into. That. Initial certification, if you want to become a certified applicator, one year of verified experience or a college degree, completion of a work course or online classroom. 
I think you all pretty much know what a private versus a commercial applicator is. The private just pertains mainly to the restricted use pesticides on your own property. Of course, commercial applicators can do it all, given their category. <clears throat> Registered employees. Um, this has more to do with businesses. Um, I think I had this year I'm supposed to do 250 um, business inspections. This time of year, that's what a lot of, I'll go through this as well in a little bit. This time of year, that's what keeps me rolling, keeps us rolling in the department. We're doing a lot of inspections this time of year. <clears throat> License and certification. Online, on our website, um, everywhere you need to get your um, appropriate material for whatever category you want um, is on our website. Um, we do have the core manual, which covers your core and a lot of what's in 1A applicable to you. Um, but there is a 1A um, book is available as well through the University of Maryland. All the website, all the links, all the phone numbers you need. These are free of charge. You can download them, look at them online. Um, the other ones you have to pay for, but you have to call Cornell, um, University of Maryland, and uh, I think Washington um, College to get the other, the other categories if you are interested. But most of you guys will deal 1A, which will be the, the University of Maryland <clears throat> website. There you go. That's a breakdown of it. Washington State, there's a few available in there. Online recertification courses I had last year. I didn't have anybody that took advantage of this year. That I've had three people, a couple people, family emergencies, and one man was had to, had to have a surgery right before um, the presentation. So it's a good option to have. Um, it's kind of an ace in the hole. But save it as a last case scenario because you can only do this once every three years, okay? So if you don't have your credits and you're in a Jimmy Jam and you need them, you can get them online. But again, once you do it, that's a mulligan you get every three years. So just bear that in mind. All right, everybody take a deep breath. Convenient, no paper forms. <laughs> it's been one of my biggest complaints since I've been with the department. The fact that, man, I used to just mail my check in, I get my card in the mail, you know, and it's, it's the time, day and age we live. You know, everybody's got a phone on their hip and does a lot of things through their computer, unfortunately, at times. But um, this is part of it. Keep an eye out for this postcard, guy, ladies and gentlemen, please. This has a, your information as far as your code that you will need. Um, so don't throw that card away if you see it. I know it kind of blends in at times. It's not huge, but it's big enough that it stands out a little bit more than a typical envelope. <clears throat> your license number course name information and that renewal code is the big thing you need when you go into to uh, renew your um, license um, big help you know I have a lot of people ask me and complain about the online renewal there's videos online tutorials now that are really nice really helpful um, it's private applicators one of them involved so a lot of you guys can go right on there just open up two windows and follow it step by step pause it you can go right through it, it it's it's really helpful but I definitely, and they've just been put up within the last six months or so, I'd say, right, Ross? Something like that. Um, not too long, but they're very, very helpful and very informative in the re renewing your license. <clears throat> that number, you need it. You sign in, you got to write that number down. So make sure you have your card and remember that number. This is an example of a public agency permit, business certification. Um, again, they'll, they have their business number here or a public agency. And then followed by that will be your applicator number, such as this. You all seen these cards before. Picture might not look so good, but you've seen these cards before. <laughs> and these as well. Here's your private applicator's card. <clears throat> Again, here's your certification number for your private applicator. Enforcement update. These are some of the things we do on a daily basis especially throughout the uh, winter time and uh, late summer when things slow down. Um, other than that, we're involved in a lot of investigations, but I don't know if those of you in the back can read, I couldn't, but it says Department of Agriculture inspection today, hide all the bad stuff, management. <laughs> so those are some of the things, little things that we deal with. Russ actually found this, it was actually taped to a door of a business he went to inspect one day, so yeah, <laughs> routine business inspections. We did 708 in 2018, um, 253 violations. Anybody want to take a guess on what most violations are before we go through them? What do you think? 
got it. <laughs> you got it. Back flow, back flow prevention, back flow preventer, little thing goes on hose, keeps um, the water from back siphoning into the well if you have it in a tank. So back flow preventer was eight of them. Storage nine, that could have a number of different things to do. Too close to a well. This all pertains to businesses, so a lot of you won't get involved with this. If you're within 50 feet of a well, you have to have secondary containment in your storage facility. Something of that nature could have gotten them. Not locked, not properly labeled. Signs, I got signs out in the vans, guys. You need a sign in your business, let me know. I can get you some. Registered employees. People, um, not only do you have to register employees as a business, but you also have to unregister them. Sometimes that slips through the cracks as well. Posting, these are little signs you see in regards to business, doing applications on yards, things of that nature. And the lovely old vehicle IDs. There you go, there's your answer. 68 violations in regards to records. Um, I'll go through this, Jenny asked me to go through this as well as far as what do you need to, for record keeping. Um, I've got another slide presentation I'll breeze through that'll be a little bit more entertaining than this one to, uh, <laughs> to get you through that. This is what you need. Um, <clears throat> I've got copies that I can give you, not today, but if you come and see me, I can definitely um, make sure you get a copy of, we've got a template to follow. It's got everything that you need on there. I'll show it later in the presentation. Um, and if you need some, I can, I can definitely get that to you one way, shape, or form. Complaint investigations. <clears throat> so we had 37 all together last year. These are neighbor versus neighbor, you know, um, referrals from the EPA. As you can see over on this side, agriculture. <clears throat> 11 complaints related to drift. Four concern violations. So these are, oops, these are your breakdown of it. Six in private, four in ground, four in aerial, and nursery in B um, for the 16. Agriculture investigations over the last 10 years. Unfortunately, as you can see, we're kind of on a upward trend um, with more people on the shore and and uh, and uh, more in, involvement with things such as bee, bees and uh, things of that nature. I'm sure this will just continue to climb. Um, storage requirements. Again, this is in regards to businesses as well, but safety equipment. You know, um, just to keep in mind some of the things you you know keep it locked, fire extinguisher warning sign let people know big thing is around here we got a lot of volunteer fire departments you know it's good to let them know if your shed catches on fire what's in that shed you know they don't want to be breathing in any way but you know something that is highly volatile uh, would be nice to know never use food containers a big push behind this gramoxone thing was people had died from gramoxone ingestion because of this little this little situation right here Oh, I got this old pop, Pepsi bottle. Let me pour this <laughs> paraquat dichloride in there and keep it for later. You know, that's a big no-no. <clears throat> children come along, children, you know, and, and don't know what it is. Curiosity, you know. We've all been there. <clears throat> Proper PPE, per, personal protection equipment. Make sure you got your gloves and stuff. It's a good little trial of what you see when you're exposed. Um, it's amazing how much it can splash your PPE and good repair, <laughs> good order. Are you wearing it? Yep. Guys, with personal protection, it's what's applicable to the label. <clears throat> and, um, you know, what's on the label is law. And this one's a good instance, especially with the public agencies. They use a lot of garland on the side of the roads, things of that nature. And personal protective equipment, if you look at that jug, and then that jug and look at the difference in between the protective equipment that's required. Whoops. You know, it's a lot different. Don't even need gloves with this one. Do with that one. So just keep that in mind. So another thing about the non-refillable containers. Smartphones. Guys, when you're applying a pesticide, you have to have that la label that you're applying, whatever pesticide you're applying in your possession. Um, you can do it on your smartphone. That's great. Download it, whatever you need to. Just bear in mind that you know, sometimes here on lovely Eastern Shore, we don't have the best cell reception, believe it or not. You know, so you may not be able to pull that label up that you're applying at that time. Um, it's just it's most, on most of the jugs, you know, you guys. And, and uh, 
So you, most of the time you have it with you. Weather conditions, we follow underground when we're looking into weather, see what it was, um, just as a little um, tidbit of information. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll definitely uh, look into, we definitely look at weather underground as far as weather records, and that comes into play when we're doing our investigations as well. Um, unlicensed businesses, you know, that's one thing that I, you know, you guys are trying to do right and have your license, you're here today, taking time away from your family, friends, work, whatever you're doing other than today, to keep your certification up, you know, and one thing that I do frown upon as an, as an investigator and inspector is the fact that people that don't do that, you know, just, you're doing your best to do what you're supposed to do, why should the not, next guy not, you know, so comes into play a lot in business with these little small guys spraying Roundup on somebody's sidewalk and they're not certified. So um, that's a big thing. Recycling program, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. How many give to the recycling, bring to the recycling centers? Okay, so um, what we do is we, when I was hired by the department, one of the amongst the many things we do, um, my supervisor, Mr. Ellis, he said, you know, one week a year, we've got a, we've got some a little bit of physical labor to do. He said it's um, it's it's jug collection, and I had this picture in my mind. I've said this before. I'm like jug collection. He didn't go into any detail. And I'm like, I'm okay. I can do physical labor. Done all my life. So right. So he said, he said we'll do jug collection. I had this picture in my mind. We were going to go around and collect these collection jugs. You know, that were like for runoff or something of that nature in regards to pesticides. Nope. One week a year, we drive all around the state, go to all these different recycle centers, and we throw jugs in this chipper all day long. <laughs> so that's our jug collection. But we, we recycled over 33 tons of plastic in 2018. Um, this plastic is used for agricultural products. It's used for tiles, um, drain tiles, field tiles, things of that nature. That's all it's um, recycled for because um, it, of course, cannot go back into food use again. So. Pretty neat that it comes back into the industry one way, shape, or form. Spotted lanternfly. I don't know how many of you guys have heard about this little critter, but it has to do a lot with the with the trees and uh, produces honeydew as it as it infests on the trees. So um, if you if you uh, spot one of these colorful little fellas and see them, just give that number a call. Forest Protection. Um, you know they'll be glad to uh, pest, plant pest protection. Sorry. And um, they'll be glad to help you and, um, you know, register it. It's all important in regards to the federal side and, uh, and um, letting them know where this invasive species is. It started out in Pennsylvania. It's down in Virginia, I think West Virginia, Delaware, now here. Um, it started out, it it's came in on a load of rocks, they believe, a load of stone. I'm sorry? Yes, ma'am. Anybody have any questions thus far? I'm trying to run through it. I know you're hungry. I hate that I'm between you and Mr. Paul Gunther's food. I don't ever want to hear you apologize for the history of your parents. All right, Mr. Speeds, we'll do. All right, sir. That's true. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Speeds. I've been, I've been around the country a little bit, and people ask me, where are you from, North Carolina or something? like, no, I'm from the Eastern Shore, Maryland. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bees. So Jenny again asked me to go through a little bit of um, our complaint to um, investigation process. And look, we take this serious. I kind of set this up as a, as a little bit of playful because I knew right before lunch, you one last thing you want to do is sit up here and listen to me talk. But, um, you know, it's something that is interesting because I've had the question um, presented to me before, Jenny, you know, what do you, what, you know, how's that happen? You know, well, I'm going to go through that a little bit, what happens, and if you ever have a complaint. I've had a complaint called in against me years ago, and Tommy Morris and I worked together on the crop production. And, um, you know, back then I was kind of blindsided and didn't have any idea of the process. You know, of course, I do now from both sides of the coin. So um, I'm going to go through it a little bit. <clears throat> so we got all these people, as I was telling you for. Remember, our investigations are going up. So a lot of people want to come here for things like these. But they act like this over things that are from here. <laughs> We're getting this more all the time. This was me. I'm a from here. So when I was a kid, that was me. Man, this is so cool. Aerial applicators, man, I wouldn't want to be one of them for anything. That was my dream job when I was a kid. It's the only thing I've not done in regards to agriculture my whole life. 
was an aerial applicator. That's all I wanted to do. And um, I wouldn't want to be one now for love of nothing. You know, the things they go through and they're called in all the time, you know, and I'll go through a little bit of that as we go through. When something dies in someone's yard or they even smell something funny, the media educated public is quick to blame farmers and commercial applicators, private applicators. <clears throat> as you can see the references there. We usually get a calm, cool, cool, calm, collect, concerned citizen blaming a private or commercial applicator. I'm sure the girls in the office would love this slide, wouldn't they, Russ? <laughs> when in actuality, they, you, nor I know where the source may have come from. You can see these are some of the examples. I love this application in the middle. I like that. That was a pretty yard before that old boy grabbed that sprayer. <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> So this is where we come in. As um, we're not only inspectors, um, we also do the inspe um, inspections of the businesses. As I say, a lot of people don't realize we're dual agents through the EPA as well, um, and we inspect schools, IPM programs, and integrated pest management. Keeps the schools from using pesticides. Basically, we inspect those as well. Um, we also do um, container containment inspections, and like to the large chemical companies that hold and produce chemicals, producer establishment inspections through the EPA. So we do a lot of things, but one of the main things we do, of course, when it comes, when push comes to shove, are the investigations and the complaints that we have called in. <clears throat> I tell everybody, this is my little, this is my little uh, get out of jail free card. You know, I've come to situations in complaints and the person's all emotional and they're getting mad at me and I'm not even the applicator and they want me to find something out that may or may not be true, and I tell them I'm there for nothing more than gathering facts. That's all I'm there for. I have no personal interest in this case. I said, I'm just here to find out what happened. That's all. So don't blame me. <laughs> this is just an example. Of, I made this up real quick. I don't know if a lot of you, if, uh, probably most of you can't see it, but um, this was a quick example of what I did in regards to an investigation file. Um, the contacts we had or we could have, you know, uh, like it's all just fictitious. But these are some of the things that we go through. Sample reports, weather records, full foliage and soil swab samples. Those are the type of samples that we'll take if we have a concern with drift. Um, application records, detailed Google Earth maps. I have to line up everything wherever I take a sample, measurements, things of that nature. Applicable labels. As an applicator, I'll contact the applicator, ask for the labels that he had and applications that he had that day. Um, so again, applications or you know, your records, you know, it'll save you. Sample results, um, those are all included in the file. And detailed photos, um, I have to take photos of what we look at and where we're looking and what we're trying, what we're finding, the facts that I find. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is just one complaint investigation file I had in 2018. Um, it was against Mr. Corman over here, actually, and he knows about it. So, um, but this was the gist of the file. I had five months from start to finish. When I got the initial complaint call in from Rob to sign the complaint to me, it was five months from start to finish. Um, when I got done, the file was over an inch thick with paperwork. We're saving trees. <laughs> over 100 pages of documents, weather records, the things that I just went through. There was over 100 pages of of documents in there. I probably had a 10 page on my memorandum alone in itself, just writing down what the contacts and the comments and, and the things I'd found. Complain, com, com, complainant, complained to the MDA PRS director, Mr. Dennis Howard, midway through my investigation about the lack of communication. I'd spoken with her ten, three times in the previous 10 days. I don't know how much she wanted me to come contact her. I don't know if she was lonely or just needed a friend, but I thought I had done my job and so did Mr. Howard and I had that all documented on my side. Just like with you, you guys have to keep your records. I have to too and it saved my butt because I had it all documented in my notes every time I contacted, um, contacted the complainant. <laughs> As a result of all that work, no detect was found of samples taken, no letters of warning or fines levied. Complainant was basically told the FAA, told to call the FAA. She was complaining about the plane flying around her house. He was taking off out of an airport that wasn't too far away from her house. But every time she saw the plane, she was 
calling in a complaint, basically, that he was spraying her and killing her. So, <laughs> Google Earth, just some pictures from, a, from a, the, my fictitious file, of course, I have here. Um, if you're not familiar, this is the 4-H Park. We are here. Very good, huh? <laughs> labels. Guys, you know, just keep your labels, um, you know, make record of them. In your record keeping, there's one little important thing. Oops. <clears throat> That lovely little EPA registration number. Um, I did an inspection on one facility, and um, it was actually a state entity, and um, they had the wrong EPA number written down on the records. Well, the outside of the container looked exactly the same for years, but that EPA label had changed four times, the registration number. So although the label looked the same, some of the verbiage in the label had changed, so it's important to make sure you keep your current registration numbers on file, and that's part of your application records. Weather, I just thought that was pretty. Um, when we take samples, although it be foliage, soil, <clears throat> or swab samples, um, we have a chain of custody um, deal where we have to follow and adhere to. Um, make sure that we take care of our samples, they're ours, and we get them into the possession of the state chemist. Um, it seems like kind of minuscule, if you will, but um, you'll see in a couple seconds how much it does really, yeah, how much it can affect um, the outcome or determination of an investigation. Um, so when we, we bag and tag them is what I call it. How about you, Russ? Bag and tag? You probably told me that. So we bag and tag them. We label them, identify them, seal them with an MDA seal, and we're done. And we get them into the possession of, their, of the state chemist. So that's what, when I go take, although it be foliage, soil or swab samples, that's what happens to them. This is how they're identified. For every sample I take, whether it be the samples I just spoke of, application records, weather records, conversations, um, whatever need be, any factual um, labels, anything I get from anybody, I, we have to identify. So I have to identify that through, these <clears throat> through the collection reports. We have physical and document, although, you know, whichever one's applicable. Um, so uh, for everything that I do, as far as a sample, I have to take and fill out one of these reports. Now, this can get a little graphic. Are you all ready? You all ready? Wake up right before lunch and get your appetite going. Get your blood going. These are some of the things we see in here. <laughs> Again, here's just a typical, you know, uh, drift situation or may have been a damaged plant. I was an applicator. I hid for years on windy days. I know what you guys do. You're not fooling me. I've been there and done that. This was a woods that I had an investigation on. And um, it's hard to see in this picture. I know it is. Um, but these were oak trees. Um, this forest was in the forest protection program. It's a beautiful oak forest. I love squirrel hawk in it. But um, it had, it had um, these oak trees. And every beech tree in that forest was just flat, just laid right over, the foliage was just hanging. And these are oak trees, and there was damage up in these trees that I could see from the ground, 60 or 70 feet up in the air. There was a farmer, he was spraying, he was probably close to a half a mile from this spot, he was spraying 2,4-D. And it did that much damage through that woods, and I, it, it was predominant on the edge where he was spraying. And his weather records started out okay, but as the day went along and he Went through his application time, the, wet, the wind, you know, here on the eastern shore, the wind always blows, and went from 7 to 10 miles an hour upward to gusts of 25 miles an hour. He was just trying to get his field done, I know, but this is some of the damage, you know, I, that I witnessed on this case. It was pretty, pretty scary, really. Luckily, he had enough of a buff, buffer between his house, the complainant's house, and his woods that the woods absorbed a lot of the, the um, drift and residue because in his yard he had all kinds of Japanese maples and little ornamental foreign trees that I didn't even know the name of. And I'm like, man, if it had gotten in that yard and, and done damage, it would have been, he would have been more upset. Russell's on me with this little investigation. This is some of our little perils we face. Bees. Um, guys, if you have llama beans and you till them and try to communicate with the beehive guys, I know a lot of you do. These are beehives that are just adjacent to llamas. And, um, Russ and I went out there for the investigation, and uh, he had a bee kill, um, and they had sprayed. But um, some of the perils I had, well, I get stung four times, 
They got stung four times trying to get pictures of the bees, the beehives. Yeah, <laughs> Russ, Russ, he was trying to chase me out of there. I just kept going back for more. <laughs> so remember my investigation in regards to our chain of custody and the things that come into play. That's me. Stand there in my lovely little position there. And this is a typical greenhouse, right? Anybody know what all that is? Any guesses? Medical marijuana. It's cannabis. Yep, those are all pot plants. <laughs> um, I got called. We were, I was happened to be the lucky one to be in the department on July 3rd last summer. I don't know if you all remember July 3rd last year, but I do. It was 98 degrees that day. And I was called and asked to go take samples inside of a, inside of a greenhouse for, we got there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I left at 8 o'clock that night for six hours. I was in a greenhouse, suited up. I, I was so wet when I was walking out of there that my breather holes on my shoes were squirting water out of the side, and I hadn't been in a pool. I had sweat, and I had put off that much sweat. It was, it was hot. So um, this was a real high-profile case that involved the governors on the state in front of the Baltimore Sun. Um, you know, it was a, it was a highly, high-profile case, and I got called to take samples. There's me about most of the way through the three quarters of the way through the thing. As you see, I'm either pretty happy or pretty tired. I don't know which one it was at that point in time. Probably both. <laughs> the happy day was almost <laughs> over. <laughs> That's right. That's what everybody said. Did you get into cheating on implants? <laughs> and then, of course, lovely little things like this. <laughs> What's that? I did. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Uh, one little thing, you know, the cannabis is monitored by the feds and the state, and there's this whole push and shove match, but I couldn't take any physical samples. One of our big things, of course, with plants is are taking foliage samples. I couldn't, we cannot transport them in our vehicles, so I can only take swab samples. But I think I took 135 samples that day, and that's, um, you know, little vials that I have to wrap with plastic, you know, tie each one off. They were just little vials. Yeah. It, it took us a while. Um, you know, I say, I say the things we see. This was an interesting picture. Now, the, if for those of you who don't see what this is, or don't know what this is, this is a pair of ladies' undergarments. The funny thing about this is I'm on the edge of like a 150-acre field on this side and like 200 acres of woods on this side. They're in a person within like a mile of this place, and I'm like, where in the devil did they come from? I just couldn't believe they were there. They were there. <laughs> I'm like, maybe it was somebody in an airplane got lucky, joined the 36,000 feet club or something. I don't know. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, I just, I'm going to skip that one. Um, <laughs> this here was, a, um, I just said, oh, no. Careful what you say when you're recording yourself. We had a lady that recorded an aerial applicator, and um, I cut it out of here because of verbiage. I did this for an inspector's course at another thing. Um, at another presentation that I did, um, the lady um, uses some pretty profane language, um, and she commences the cussing like a sailor on there. But basically, there's an aerial applicator flying over her property, and she said, I'm going to shoot him out of the sky. And then she puts it on YouTube. So then it became my, available to me when you put it on YouTube. So I pulled off YouTube and I recorded it. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, you know, those are the things that we face. Um, and some of the complaints we've had, these are some of the, some of the statements and things I've heard just in the last couple years. Complaints have ranged from, he's pouring chemicals all over my property, to that, to that spare man made me sick. Um, the lady I was talking about that, with that file I spoke of earlier, that was an inch thick, all the contact. At one point in time, she said, yeah, I took my granddaughter to the doctor, and she got pink eye. She got pink eye from that sprayer man. That's exactly what she told me. I don't know if you all know what pink eye is, but it has nothing to do with pesticides. <laughs> Maybe manure, so you nutrient management guys better look out. Okay, nothing to do with pesticides. <laughs> Two, I hate pesticides and anyone that uses them. I should be able to make him not be able to spray his property. Like I said earlier, that lady that did that as well. I even have one person say, I think they're terrorists. They're all trying to kill me. So the things we see on an investigation just amaze me. Some seen here sometimes just amaze us. <clears throat> Finally, we all have to deal with the public and their point of view, so remember, keep accurate application records. Please keep records, um, and I'll go through that sheet. Everybody's got one of these on their hip nowadays, got a little camera on it, a little video recorder, 
And, um, you know, they're all just out to use them all the time. So just remember that. This is a copy of the application records. Um, it's hard to see up top here. List everything that you need. It's not as, not as ominous as it looks. Examples of what information is needed in application records. Remember, applicator is ultimately responsible for his application. Jenny had asked me in regards to if you're doing an application or if um, a commercial applicator is doing an application, a contracted application for you, um, app, the, the applicator is ultimately responsible. <clears throat> so if ABC Sprayer Company is doing your field, ABC Sprayer Company is liable for their, app, for their application. As you as a farmer, you know, it's not required, but at the same time, you get receipts most of the time that has exactly what they put on that field. EPA, a lot of times it has weather conditions. It's basically a spray record that's your invoice. Um, if not, you can get access to them and you can keep them on your file. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm bad about I mean, <laughs> keeping records and things that I need to, to make sure that I'm in compliance. Um, many of you know I fly red tail hawks and I'm a falconer. I'm licensed through the federal government and my file is two to T. And when inspectors come to me, I'm like, here you go. And, you know, it saves me so much trouble and, and really does uh, uh, cover my hiney a lot of times. <clears throat> I want to thank you all. I hope you all have a great season. Thanks again. You know, a lot of you know me. If you have any questions, just give me a call anytime. I'll be glad to help any way I can. Again, thanks, Jenny, and thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a great day and a wonderful season. Let's hope for some sunny, warm weather. <laughs> thanks, Jenny.